Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back for another episode. It's so exciting today and a little bit, um, conf- I have conflicting feelings because today is our last planned uh, live episode for our summer series. And I think, Tania, when we first kind of put this together, we were thinking people would be getting ready to go back to school, back to work. And this was supposed to have just kind of gone right up to that line. And right. we're, that we're not going year. anywhere. No, we're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I, that's kind of why I use that little caveat planned episode because we might have to have a little something else up our sleeves but as of right now this is it and I'm a little sad because it's been fun it has been so much fun as we've talked about on the show we learn a lot from doing this we uh, you know we love hearing from our viewers who share their questions and their experiences so we're really thankful Yes, very much so. Very much so. So um, just a reminder, or if somebody is new here today, I am Renata Yarborough Sanders, and I am coming to you from Newport News, Virginia. Um, I am a um, an experienced researcher with um, almost about 23 years of experience, and all of my ancestry, except for one person who was born just over the state line, all of my ancestry uh, hails from North Carolina. And so um, I'm excited to be here, very excited about today's show. And I'm going to try not to drop any tears as it's coming to a close. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you. Hi, everyone. I'm Tania Kutz, and I'm coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. I have been on my genealogy journey for about 16 years now. And like we're not a, all my ancestors are from North Carolina, particularly mostly eastern part of the state. Well, you deserve some music for that. <laughs> <laughs> and we have with us today our guest, Shannon Christmas. And Shannon, if you'll say a quick hello, the time is yours to do that. Thank you ever so much, Renata. <laughs> hello, everyone. Uh, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, and I want to thank Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy for having me today. Uh, we are very excited that you're here, Shannon. Absolutely. Can't you, can't you hear it in my voice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you ever so much. All right, so we are not going to waste time today because we know that Shannon has a lot Oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I did something and all of a sudden I heard something. But we Uh, know Shannon has a lot to share with us. Just going to take a minute to welcome a few of our um, viewers today. I was very excited to see uh, my fellow Black uh, Progen, Bernice Bennett is in the house today and Mavis and my neighbor Selma is here. Deborah Robinson, welcome. Tania, if I miss any, you let me know. I see QV uh, McCray is here. Thank you so yes. much. There's Shelly Murphy, another Absolutely. Black Progen. Uh, who else do we have here, Tania? We've got Shirley Brockenborough on the call, on the show with us today. Dale Colston. Uh, I think you said Mavis already. Carrie Bright. So yeah, we, we are loving it. We love that you are here and being so supportive and are here to learn with us. <laughs> and our top fan, Ron Hans- Hayslip Hansberry. <laughs> He's always here uh, from... Now, this is the first time I've seen him put this on here. Wilbra Ham. Massachusetts or Maine? Wait, M-A. M-A Maine. is Maine. It was Massachusetts. Yes. Massachusetts, okay. Yes. yes. All right, the overambitious one is here from New Jersey always. And, we, you know, I think I, I said this a couple of shows ago that it seems like we have regulars now, yes. you know, <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. There's Sherry hudson Passy. She's mm-hmm. been so faithful. Margo, we're just so happy to see you. Uh, Drusilla Pear, who's going to be with us on the Q&A panel. And we'll come back and grab a few more of these names at the end. I always look back at the chat chat later and I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't call that person. I didn't realize they were there. So um, charge it to my crazy (laughs) head and not my heart. Ellen Bentley, glad to see you, Dale Calston. And I think we should just go ahead and get started. So um, Tania is going to be up first and she's going to share a little bit with you about her 
DNA experiences. So it's yes. all up on you, Tania. All right, happy to do that. Are you seeing my screen? I just want to be sure it's presenting correctly. Uh, yes. Okay, excellent. So I wanted to share a quick story just as a testament to how much it pays off to give time a chance to work because you never know how your DNA will, stories will come through. So this is a, a cousin that we, well, we connected back in spring of 2015. And she contacted me because I was her highest match when she got her 23 to me results back. And so here's a highlight from an email she sent. She we wanted to connect. And you know, 23 and me gives you an estimate for how they think you might be connected. And so it said we might share second great grandparents. So that was really all I could tell from the very beginning because this cousin actually did not have information about one side of her family due to a um like a non-parental event. So I was able to tell her and share with her, however, that I had a clue as to which one of my ancestral couples we might be connected through. And I was able to offer this clue because I've been fortunate to have several family members test. And so she matched my mother, Diane. She matched my uncle, Leonard. So this is my mom's brother. She matched a first cousin of my mom and my uncle, and she matched another cousin that was first cousins with my grandmother, Alice. So because she matched all four of these people, I was able to say, well, it looks like we share in common uh, Andrew McNair and Gracie Bullock. So these are my second great grandparents um, that I have. Uh, sorry, okay, I just was checking on something that I have in the tree. So I was able to offer her those clues. Then I use DNA Painter to map my parents' DNA. Both of them have tested. So this is my mother's um, DNA Painter. And the blue segments are DNA that she inherited from Andrew and Gracie. Well, my cousin S matched exactly on those blue segments. So it's another confirmation from our triangulation process that Shannon will tell us all about. <laughs> so <know> he will. <laughs> <laughs> Fast forward another three years. Cousin contacts me back and she says she has had a close blood relative show up in her DNA results. And within an hour of talking to her new blood relative, I was able to see and get clues as to how we connected because her blood relative had done his tree. And I saw this person in his tree, Jonah Knight, who comes from Edgecombe County, right next to my family in Washington, and I have family in Edgecombe. So I said, oh. This is a clue. Let me look further. Mm -hmm. Well, Jonah, I had his death certificate, which lists his parents, Blunt Knight and Lucinda Bullock. Now, Bullock name looked familiar, right? At the top of this yeah. tree is Gracie Bullock. And so through conversations with extended cousins, through documentation of additional, you know, looking at additional records, we were able to confirm that our ancestry was through Gracie's parents. And here's just a quick snapshot from the 1880 census of my second great grandmother, Gracie, my cousin's ancestor, Lucy, Lucinda, in the household of their parents, Lawrence Bullock and Jenny. So this was a great example of time working to our advantage to help us make a connection from a single DNA test result. So Absolutely. I was I just wanted to share that story with you. Excuse me. Uh -huh. that, that's great. That was really good work. Oh, um, we had so much fun with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, we are detectives when we're doing the regular paper trail research. But the addition of the DNA piece has made us double detectives. We that's have right. another angle to come from on that. All right. Well, we don't want to take up too much time. So let me get right to the... Um, the little piece that I'd like to share with you. Um, I give a presentation um, called the case, from, the case for DNA to test or not to test. And what I decided to do is to just pull two slides from that presentation to share with you in preparation for Shannon's presentation. And that this slide has to do with preparing yourself emotionally and actually also educationally to do DNA testing and to receive your results. And you see, I have the different little um, faces, the little emojis over to the side. And that's because with DNA testing, 
you are opening yourself up to a gamut of emotions and you're going to find results that might be frightening, uh, might be make you happy. You'll find some results that will definitely sadden you, uh, possibly make you cry. You will find sometimes results that are gonna bring out anger in you. You're definitely going to have surprises. That's kind <laughs> yes. of the, the, the overall thing that you can do. So, you know, I hear people say, I know my ancestry. No, you don't. Okay. You, none of us knows every single thing that the people came before us did and when they did it and who they were and who they did it with. So just stop because you don't. So there, there are going to be some surprises. And then sometimes you find something that's just silly. It's just, you know, there's nothing you can do except laugh about it. And the good part is if you have someone else you can laugh about it with. But as you are preparing to um, do DNA testing, one of the important things that I advise people to do is to let your family members know that you are testing. And the reason for that is because of all of these emotions that you might be in for, the surprises that you may find. And what I encourage people to do is to ask the family members, do you want to know what I find out or not? So I had an uncle who tested for me so that I could, um, well, I thought I was going to be finding out about my hill line. And he took the test for me, but he told me he had a, he, he had a, a animosity towards the person that he knew to be his father. And he said, I don't wanna know anything about what you find out. I don't wanna know anything about Daniel Hill, which is my grandfather. I'll do this for you, but don't tell me anything about it. And so when I found out that Daniel Hill wasn't his father, I didn't tell him because he asked me not to. I did talk to his children about it but I did not, the decision amongst all of us was to not tell him. So give your family the opportunity to make that decision for themselves. Also, while you're spending time waiting for your results to come in and you can get anxious and antsy about it, take that time to educate yourself. There are gazillions of videos on YouTube. There are webinars that you can watch. You can get books. Um, DNA for Dummies, you can get Blaine Bettinger's book, you can get so many books to teach yourself what to expect when you get those results back. So use your time wisely and educate yourself. Also, I encourage you to seek support or guidance before and after viewing your results. If you are testing for a reason, like you want to find out who your birth parents were, or, you know, is this person your sibling, and you already know there's some emotion attached to it, you might wanna go ahead and maybe do some counseling or at least talk to people in the genealogy world who can guide you um, through that process. Or if you get a surprise and you're having a hard time dealing with it, reach out for some counsel then. Be prepared to hear from your matches. That's why those of us who are genealogists are here. We care about the matches. We don't care as much about ethnicity estimates, which you know a lot of the population is testing for right now. Oh, say so, that again. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you opt out, and we don't want you to opt out, if you don't opt out, you're going to hear from people who are matching you. So please check the inbox for whichever service you're using and respond in some way to the people who are reaching out to you. Um, also try to become a part of the genealogy community. There are Facebook groups for all you know, different facets of genealogy, including DNA. So look for those, just do a search and kind of join in and get used to talking to other people who are taking an interest in this topic. Um, and I mentioned those eth eth ethnicity estimates, which are simply what they are called. They are estimates. So don't let those, those uh, ethnicity estimates change who you think you are or how you feel about yourself. Let them enrich you. If you find out that you have some part of yourself that is from a place that you didn't know, embrace it, learn about it, and use that opportunity to try to uncover who the ancestors were that gave you that piece of your ethnicity. 
And last but not least, embrace the new connections that you're going to make. And I should have put this in red and flashed it like this, share your tree. Please put, create a family tree, first of all, if you haven't, and attach it to your DNA profile. So those are just some suggestions from me okay. for how you can prepare for DNA testing. And last but not least, I just want to kind of, this is also from my presentation, just remind you that we have to accept our DNA stories. And Shannon's gonna be talking about DNA stories with us today. DNA does not lie. There are some things you will learn where there can be some exceptions to the general rule, but in, but basically what your DNA is telling you is the true story of your genetic history. Everyone that you see on this collage, these are all people that I have met that are my DNA relatives. And the only ones that I haven't met in person are the ones you see down here in the corner because they're out in Idaho and uh, Montana. And we haven't met in person, but we've met on the phone and on the computer. Everybody else you see here, including our speaker for today, is a genetic relative of mine. So keep an open mind and be willing to accept your own DNA story. And that's it for me. So now it's time for the man of the hour that we've all been waiting for, Shannon Christmas. And just a reminder that while Shannon is presenting to us, if you have questions that you would like to have asked during the uh, after chat, please type, the, excuse me, type, I can talk, I can, type them into the chat and we will be sure to um, have those presented to Shannon during the after chat. I know Tania and I usually kind of break in and make conversation and stuff, but we're gonna probably do a little less of that today because Shannon has a, a probably, uh, well, I'm not gonna say how long, but it's a good long presentation planned and we probably don't have that much we can say about it anyway. <laughs> so, so Tania, is there anything else before we bring Shannon on? No, I think we're ready to hear from Shannon. Okay, yeah, that's right. Cause Shannon, we're not gonna see, we're gonna see Shannon's picture. So Shannon, the floor is yours. I think I have unshared. Yes, so it's all yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you ever so much. I am Shannon Christmas. I am a professional genetic genealogist. And I am here to talk to you about the stories in your DNA and how to access them. I think that there has been a lot of conversation about DNA testing in terms of what they call ethnicity, but there's often less conversation about genealogy and family history and what it means to take a genealogical DNA test. So genealogists use genealogical DNA test to, you guessed it, help solve genealogical problems. In other words, they want to find ancestors. They want to determine relationships. They want to understand more about their families. So we use these tests to help develop and test relationship hypotheses, to organize all of these DNA matches, some of whom may not make sense to us. And also to break down those brick walls and find those ancestors that have been hiding from us for so many years. But even more so, we want to understand how we are related to the people who show up on our match list and determine who the most recent common ancestors are connecting them to us. So we turn to four different types of DNA in order to do this when the paper records and the oral history just don't seem to do what we need to do. So the first type of DNA that we have often used is called Y chromosome DNA. 
This is DNA that is found on one's Y chromosome. And because only men have Y chromosomes, this type of DNA is transmitted from father to son each generation. And that allows us to trace our direct paternal line, our father's 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 line. On the other hand, mitochondrial DNA is passed down from mother to child each generation. In other words, all of us have mitochondrial DNA, but only women are able to pass it down to their offspring. Men inherit the mitochondrial DNA, but they cannot pass it on to anyone. That specific inheritance pattern makes mitochondrial DNA especially useful for tracing one's direct maternal line, one's mother's, 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 mother's side. Autosomal DNA and X chromosome DNA are different from Y chromosome DNA and mitochondrial DNA because we inherit that from all of our ancestors within at least the last five generations, allowing us to trace all of our family lines. Now for a long time, DNA test companies only tested Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. And so that gave us a very limited range of mysteries that we could investigate with DNA. So here is a case study based in North Carolina history where Y DNA was helpful for clarifying an ancestor's paternity. So the gentleman that you see pictured here is my great, great grandfather, Erasmus Christmas. And we start out with the hypothesis, the oral history, that his biological father was his slaveholder, Louis Yancey Christmas. Uh, the evidence that is available is oral history. It is the names that appear on the death and marriage records of Erasmus's siblings. And it is also the fact that Erasmus and some of his siblings were emancipated by the will of Louis Yancey Christmas. And they were offered an inheritance of $10,000. Now that is more of a quarter of a million dollars in today's currency. So that was a substantial sum uh, for that time frame. But beyond that, there is no specific document that indicates that Erasmus is one of Lewis's children. They did not have birth certificates back in 1830 in Warren County, North Carolina, where Erasmus Christmas was born. And we have no other type of documentation available to really look at this. So what do we do? We turn to DNA. So an initial Y DNA analysis from 23andMe back in 2010, let me know that my Y DNA haplogroup was L21, also known as R1B, 1B, 2A, 1A, 2F star. And that that was a European Y DNA haplogroup. Since if you trace my Y-DNA ancestors, they go back to Erasmus Christmas, this at least lets me know that Erasmus Christmas had a European progenitor. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I took a more advanced 
a Y DNA test over at Family Tree DNA, what was known as the Y DNA 37 test. And that provided some additional evidence because that connected me to a descendant, a Christmas descendant of Lewis's two times great grandfather. So this individual was a cousin of Lewis Yancey Christmas. So this provided additional supporting evidence that Lewis Yancey Christmas was in fact the father of my great great grandfather. What was interesting was that this particular match also tested his DNA with a British uh, DNA testing company called Oxford Ancestors and was matched with another Mr. Christmas whose family has been in England for centuries. So this made it very clear that this particular Y DNA line was not only solid in the US, but solid in England. And that we could say that this particular line was shared with the Christmases in America and the Christmases in England, which fit in with the documented history that the Christmases immigrated from England in the 17th century to Virginia. So if you want to truly dig into a Y DNA question, then you might want to go to Family Tree DNA because they provide the best Y DNA option. And it is the best option because it is, well, the only option for this type of testing. You want to start with the Y DNA 37 test and then upgrade as needed to Y DNA 67. And if necessary, Y DNA 111. The more markers you test, the more mutations will be evaluated and the higher the resolution will be for your results. And once again, you will find that at Family Tree DNA. Mitochondrial DNA, on the other hand, follows a similar inheritance pattern, but it tends to be less genealogically informative. For a number of reasons, it only traces female lines, one's mother's, 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 mother's line. And as you know, women tend to change surnames each generation. And on top of that, mitochondrial DNA mutates extremely slowly, meaning that you and another individual could have a completely identical mitochondrial DNA signature. But your most recent common ancestor on that mitochondrial DNA line, the source of that shared mitochondrial DNA, might be as far back as 1,000 years ago. And most of us do not have family trees going back 1,000 years on our mother's 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 line. Now, I have heard people say that they have traced their family back to Adam and Eve, but to say the least, I have my doubts. <laughs> and before I go any further, I want to indicate that there are some success stories with mitochondrial DNA, so it can be useful for genealogy. Uh, this picture here is indicative of such a success story. Uh, the gentleman, the living gentleman, uh, bespectacled as he is, is Mr. Ibsen of Canada. And you see, Mr. Ibsen's mitochondrial DNA was instrumental in identifying the the remains of King Richard III of England, whose remains were found in a car park in England. Because you see, King Richard III's sister was an ancestor of Mr. Ibsen on his direct maternal line. 
So they have the exact same mitochondrial DNA. So this is one DNA verified relationship, one mitochondrial DNA verified relationship uh, that proves that mitochondrial DNA can be useful for genealogical research. If you think you might want to do mitochondrial DNA analysis, which by the way is very useful for digging into questions of biogeographical origin or ethnicity, then you would want to start with a full mitochondrial sequence. And that is because it tests the entire mitochondria. And as with the Y, with mitochondrial DNA analysis, the more markers you test, the more mutations are found, the higher the resolution, the results, and the more useful it is. And again, you want to test with family tree DNA because family tree DNA is the only place to get a full mitochondrial DNA analysis. Now, the real focus of genealogical DNA testing these days is what we call nuclear DNA. That includes the autosomal DNA found on chromosomes 1 through 22, as well as X chromosome DNA. That's DNA found on the X chromosome. Now, X chromosome DNA has a very unique inheritance pattern in that men only inherit X chromosome DNA from their mothers, whereas women inherit X chromosome DNA from both parents. But in such an arrangement that you cannot have X chromosome DNA transmitted from father to son in any way. So you want to chart out your X chromosome DNA ancestors. Uh, it is like a Fibonacci sequence, if you remember that from your elementary and middle school math days. Autosomal DNA, on the other hand, is inherited from all of one's ancestors within the last five generations and is randomly distributed on chromosomes one through 22 you get two copies of each of the autosomes. You get two copies of chromosomes one through 22. Men only get one copy of the X chromosome. Women get two copies of the X chromosome. Ancestry DNA. 23andMe, MyHeritageDNA, FamilyTreeDNA's Family Finder, and Living DNA. Analyze nuclear DNA and make matches, genetic relatives, on the basis of that analysis. Now, I know that there is a lot of focus on admixture results. In other words, those pesky percentages that you see at all of the companies. But this is not incredibly useful by itself for genealogical research. If you really want to get to the meat and potatoes, as they say, if you really want to get to the answers to your questions, then you have to move beyond this. But you also have to realize that many of your matches are testing solely for this. There are many social media mavens testing to get a molecular selfie. <laughs> they want to get this. They want to get this image of what they are, of who they think they are at the molecular level, and then post it to social media to get attention for themselves, to say, hey, everyone, look at me. Because apparently, they think that they are more interesting than they actually are. But one must realize that the real power of this comes from the fact 
that this is DNA inherited from all of one's ancestors. That's the real power comes from what we call the detection of identity by descent. Now, identity by descent refers to stretches of shared DNA on chromosomes one through 22 and the X chromosome. These are pieces of DNA that you share with someone else. These pieces of shared DNA are measured in what we call centimorgans, just as we would measure the space in a room in square feet. We measure DNA in centimorgans. And the more DNA you share, the more related you are. The less DNA you share, oftentimes, the more distantly related you are. That shared DNA is genetic inheritance from a common ancestor. Shared DNA simply means you are related. The question is, how are you related? Once again, the more central organs you share, the longer the DNA segments are, the more DNA segments you share, the closer the relationship likely is. The less DNA you share, the shorter the DNA segments, the fewer DNA segments that you share. Those often indicate that you are more distantly related. So these are things to keep in mind when you are evaluating genetic evidence of a genealogical relationship. This is information that you use to unlock the stories hiding in your DNA. To get the most out of this type of DNA testing, you need to test everyone everywhere. You want to start with testing yourself at Ancestry DNA and at 23andMe. Typically, this costs about $99 per test. But right now, there are a number of summer sales providing everyone with access to this information at a deep discount. Don't wait. Get your test kit now. After you receive your results from Ancestry DNA, you want to download your raw DNA data and transfer that data to Family Tree DNA's Family Finder. The basic upload is free, but if you want access to the more advanced tools, then I recommend you pay the $19 required to access those. You also want to transfer your raw DNA data to a third party DNA site called gedmatch.com once again, the initial transfer is free, but a donation is recommended. And if you donate $10 per month, then you get access to a suite of advanced tools. And those tools are sweet. I highly recommend opting for that. You also want to transfer your raw DNA data to MyHeritage DNA. My Heritage DNA also offers a free upload, but if you want access to many of the tools, then you will want to get a My Heritage subscription. And you also want to upload your raw DNA data to Living DNA. They now are not only accepting transfers, but are also providing matches, which they were not doing for some time. Uh, so that is another pool to fish in. And you want to repeat all of these steps for as many close relatives as possible. The best people to test are your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. The next best people to test are your aunts and uncles, grand-aunts and grand-uncles, first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, and if you have them, two times great grandparents. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there are some proven methodologies which have been very useful for attacking genealogical problems and unlocking the stories encoded in your DNA. They include genetic networking and clustering, chromosome mapping, and match filtering and grouping, as well as relationship prediction and hypothesis testing. And we will talk about each and every one of those. Genetic networking and clustering involves identifying a group of DNA matches who match you and all match each other. Matches in these genetic networks often share a common ancestor. One must collect and compare the family trees of everyone within that genetic network, within that cluster, and compare them to identify the most recent common ancestor. Now, each of the autosomal DNA test companies have a way for you to do this manually. Ancestry DNA and MyHeritage DNA call this shared matches. 23andMe has a feature called Relatives in Common, and Family Tree DNA's Family Finder has what they call an in common with feature. Living DNA also has a shared matches tool. Essentially, you click on the profile of one of your matches, and a list of shared matches appears. You want to look at the tree of that initial match and compare it to the trees of all the shared matches and see if you find a common ancestor. Now, this is especially useful for attempting to understand how people are related. What is most important is that when you find the common ancestors connecting people within these groups of shared matches, you want to annotate your matches profiles. Each of the DNA testing sites has a notes feature and you want to use that. You want to use that to list the names of the common ancestors. As you see here, I've annotated my matches over at Ancestry DNA so that when I see them, I automatically know who our common ancestors are. And Ancestry also provides you with colored dots to create these groups. So what you do is you create one colored dot for each pair of most recent common ancestors. So for my great, great, great grandparents, Solomon Neverdon and Zacharetta Blackwell, I created a colored dot, a blue dot from what I can tell here, that is immediately associated with them. I also star the matches whom I have sent a message to so that I know that I've already begun communicating with them, okay? So it is important to remain organized when you are doing your genetic networking. And I'm sure some of you are saying, oh, well, most of my matches do not have trees. Well, that does not necessarily have to be a problem. You just have to learn how to stalk your matches. That's right. You need to stalk your matches. It is okay in the 21st century to be a stalker. You want to use Ben Verified and other people's search sites to learn about your match, where they have been living who their family members are. And you can begin to use this information that you are scraping from the web to build out a family tree for them. You can seek out obituaries. You can seek out find a grave entries and break down that information 
to build family trees for your matches on ancestry and family search. Another way to use some of the narcissism that some of our matches display is to hone in on the fact that many of these matches now do not build trees, but are sure to upload their headshots. You just do a right click on their photograph on 23andMe. And if you are using Google Chrome, you will get the option to search Google for this image. The search results will include photographs of your match that have been posted on other websites. Those other websites often contain more information about your match that will allow you to build out family trees for them. You also want to Google your match's username and alias because oftentimes that username has been used elsewhere on social media profiles, for instance. And those social media profiles are often gold mines for more information on your match's ancestors. Another place where you can find information to build family trees and builds them far back enough to identify your most recent common ancestor. Now, if you want to automate the process of building genetic networks and clustering, then you want to go to Genetic Affairs. They have a tool known as Auto Clusters, which will go and retrieve match data for you, including the shared matches, and create an image like you see on the right. It will chart the clusters of matches who match you and match each other. And if you have done what I've already told you to do, if you have annotated your matches, then this will be incredibly useful to you. Because what will happen is when you've used genetic affairs to create these genetic networks to cluster your matches, whether through DNA GEDCOM or MyHeritage DNA or GEDmatch, which have already integrated the auto cluster tool into their sites, then you will also get a list of your clusters like this. So as you see here, cluster one contains a number of matches and you see a preview of the notes for each match. And because I annotated each of those matches with the names of the common ancestors, you see the pattern within the cluster. You see that the common ancestors are my great, great grandparents, Richard Lewis and Mary Terrell of Warren County, North Carolina. And so for those individuals for whom I could not determine who the common ancestor was, because either I did not have enough information to build a tree for them, or they made their tree private and their names are so common that I cannot research them on my own, then I know that they too must have some connection to Richard Lewis Jr. and Mary Terrell of Warren County, North Carolina. So there is a bit of a success story brewing there. So once again, if you want to make the most of this, you need to enter the notes for all of your matches in the commercial DNA databases, wherever they are and list the names of the most recent common ancestors in the notes section at every site. Shannon, can I ask a quick question? Are you saying that the, uh, the um, yes, that right there, <laughs> that it produces the list that you showed on the next slide? 
with yes, the written does. names. Okay, that's good because I yes. don't do well with colors and blocks. Okay. Yes, and I often see that people hone in on the colored blocks here, the clusters, and that way. When what they really should do is scroll down to read those lists that you just mentioned. <laughs> And so once again, immediately, if you've done what I've told you, you can assign each cluster to a specific ancestral line. So unsolved matches in those clusters likely have a connection to the common ancestors associated with each genetic network, okay? So once again, if you don't have a list that looks like this, when you've done your auto clustering, then you have not done all that you can do. You are not doing it right. And there's also a third party tool called MedBetter DNA that allows you to do match sorting and filtering at Ancestry DNA using the notes feature, using the content of your notes. So you might want to add that to your toolbox. And once again, that is MedBetter DNA. And you can find that at the Google Chrome store. It is a Google Chrome extension. Google Chrome is your friend. <laughs> so the next methodology that has been helpful for sourcing genetic evidence is called chromosome mapping. This involves tagging segments of shared DNA to specific ancestors. This requires you to have access to matching DNA segment data. So if you have only tested at Ancestry DNA, which does not provide access to matching DNA segment data, then you want to ensure that you transfer your raw DNA data to all of the other websites that I mentioned and get your matches to do the same. So access to matching segment data requires you to have a profile, not only at GEDmatch, but also at 23andMe, MyHeritageDNA, and FamilyFinder, and LivingDNA. Now, chromosome mapping involves a two-step process. The first step is known as segment triangulation, the second step is known as pedigree comparison. Segment triangulation involves identifying a group of matches who all match you and match each other on the same DNA segment. This is what we call a triangulated group. Everyone who matches up on that segment inherited that segment from the same ancestor. The question is, who is that common ancestor? That is the million dollar question. Or some might say the million hour question, because it might take you a long time to answer that question if you are working with individuals who do not have trees and have done a really great job of covering their tracks. The key to answering that question is pedigree comparison. That means you collect the family trees of your matches and compare them to see which ancestors you have in common. Now, DNA Painter is a very nice tool that allows you to map your chromosomes very easily. All you have to do is after you have found a match and identified the most recent common ancestor shared with that match, is copy the shared DNA segment data. If you look very closely at the image here, you will see the box that says paint a match. And so I have a cousin, Michael, who I know is related to me through my three times great grandparents who you heard me mention a little bit earlier today, Louis Yancey Christmas and Jenny. 
Uh, and so I copied the matching DNA segment data. In other words, the locations of the DNA that I share with Michael on the chromosomes. And I pasted that into the paint a match box. And you see there is an option that says overlay these segments or save a match now. You want to click save the match now. And then you will have the option of attaching that DNA to either an ancestor that you've already painted once before into DNA Painter or for a new ancestor. And so you want to assign the matching segments to the most recent common ancestor and identify a color because this is what chromosome mapping is. It is essentially color coding your DNA according to the common ancestors. So in this case, I put in the names of the common ancestors I share with Michael and selected a color. And I also put into the notes exactly who the common ancestors were and the pathway uh, that Michael descends from those common ancestors. So I included the names of the parents, grandparents, great grandparents, etc., back to our common ancestors. And you can see here the visualization of the actual shared DNA on chromosome 9. So those segments are now mapped. And you can see in the larger chromosome map here where those DNA segments fit in. Okay. And you also get a list of the ancestors that you have painted when you do this type of chromosome mapping, okay, in DNA Painter. So you want to start with assigning ancestors to your closest DNA matches and work your way down your match list. And 23andMe users who have tested one or more parents have an option of importing your 23andMe ancestry composition data into DNA Painter. This will allow you to begin the process of actually painting your DNA segments by biogeographical origin. So in the case of the segment that I shared with Michael, for instance, I not only get to know that I inherited those from Lewis Yancey Christmas and Ginny, but I also get to know which of those segments is European and which of those segments are African, okay? So this is a great thing to do if you can, okay? And for those who are wondering, the annotating of your DNA matches profiles is the beginner level work that you want to start with. The genetic networking and clustering is the intermediate level work that you want to begin doing. The filtering and grouping of matches, that is intermediate level as well. Chromosome mapping is the more advanced work that you want to start doing, okay? Now, DNA Painter also allows you to essentially model relationships and look at shared DNA and begin to build hypotheses about relationships. So their shared Centimorgan tool will allow you to type in the amount of shared DNA and convert that into possible relationships. It will also allow you to convert the Centimorgan tools or Centimorgan totals into percentages and percentages into Centimorgans. So it allows you to look at the data in different ways, but more importantly, it allows you to understand what that amount of DNA means in terms of how you might be related 
to the individual sharing that DNA with you. Okay. DNA Painter also has the what are the odds tool that allows you to model relationships to see where someone might fit into your family tree. You simply enter your matches or your genetic networks into a tree with the amounts of shared DNA. That will allow you to see probabilities of how you might be related to this person or where you might fit into a family tree. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here is a case study where what are the odds was especially useful for a paternity hypothesis. So some of you may have heard of the story of Rebecca Hall, a formerly enslaved woman who had two sets of children with, according to lore, two different gentlemen. Uh, her first child was a Frank Plummer pictured here. Frank Plummer was said to be the son of Dr. Alfred Plummer of Warren County, North Carolina. He was a former slaveholder who was said to have been the father of Rebecca's first child, Frank Plummer. But there isn't any paperwork that specifically says that Dr. Alfred Plummer was the father. We just have oral history. We also have DNA. So there were two related Alfred Plummers in the family who could have been Frank Plummer's father. And we use DNA to look at which one was the most likely candidate for Frank Plummer's father. And what we learned when we looked at the DNA matches for a direct descendant of Frank Plummer was that it was absolutely impossible for Dr. Alfred Plummer to be the father of Frank Plummer. However, it was possible that Dr. Alfred Plummer's nephew, also named Alfred Plummer, was the father of Frank Plummer. And we used the what are the odds tool to model the relationships and deduce that it probably was private Alfred Plummer, not Dr. Alfred Plummer, who was the father of Frank Plummer. So that is how DNA helped to unlock the real story of Frank Plummer's paternity. And here is, again, the evidence as it was presented in terms of hypotheses uh, and their probability of being uh, real or not uh, by the what are the odds tool. So that is the end of my presentation. And I stand ready for any questions that any of you might have. And I want to say thank you ever so much for listening. And if you want to reach out to me privately, you can do so at throughthetreesblog.tumblr.com. Wow, Shannon, my head's exploding. <laughs> oh, and I'm sorry, <laughs> it's work? <laughs> I mean, I have heard Shannon's talks zillions of times, and I always think I've got it, but then he comes with more and I know that I need to work harder. <laughs> so I will personally be replaying this episode and stopping along the way and trying to uh, take advantage of some of what I just heard. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, give yourself a little break. We're gonna do a little housekeeping and then we're gonna come back. We do have questions for you. So in just a few mm -hmm. minutes, we'll come back and just thank you so very, yes, very thank much. You. Some presentation. <laughs> oh, well, thank you ever <laughs> so much. All right. So I am going to share my oh. screen. Oh, do you have something, Tania? Shannon, can you stop sharing your screen, please? 
That way Renata can share hers. Excellent. Okay. So I hope everybody has enjoyed Shannon's presentation. I think we all need a little breather. <laughs> so uh, we'll take the time as we always do to talk about what is coming up next on the show. And coming up next on Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy is our uh, closing session, which is not going to be live on YouTube. It is our question and answer <laughs> panel with some of our North Carolina genealogy experts. It will take place on what is the fifth Saturday in August. This is the only uh, month that out of the summer that had a fifth Saturday. So as you know, we decided to do something with it. And it will be at our regular time of 1230 Eastern time, but you must register to join us on Zoom. And you can find the registration information on our Facebook page. Uh, which many of you are already following. If you're not, just look for Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy on Facebook. And it will also be in the show links for this, for this uh, episode, as well as it's in, I think, four through six, right? Mm -hmm. Tania, it's already yes. in there. So yes. we do, um, we're, what, about a little better than halfway full right now for the capacity of the Zoom webinar. So please get registered and please, please, please send your questions if you can ahead of time to us at North Carolina NC Summer Series 2020 at gmail.com. Uh, as long as you are there that day, your questions will be read. And if you don't send them to us ahead of time, that's fine. You'll be able to tap to type them into the chat that day, or we'll give you the option of asking your questions over audio yourself. So uh, just sending them ahead of time just allows us to kind of know what's about to kind of happen. So um, on that day right now, we have nine panelists. Um, and first there's um, yours truly, uh, myself, Renata Yarborough Sanders, and Tania. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> also joining us uh, on the 29th will be Diane A.C. Richard, who you probably will remember helped us start off our summer series. She joined us for episode one when we were talking about birth records. We'll also have Drusilla Pear, who I think is in the chat if she didn't leave yet. And she was with us for episode two, where we talked about marriage records. We'll have Lisa Listen, who was our episode three presenter. That was our death records episode. And today's presenter, Shannon Christmas, who we all know is his specialty is genetic genealogy, but he is also just an all around awesome genealogy researcher as are all four of these above. Mm -hmm. And we're also delighted to be able to have additional panelists as part of the Q&A that have not been guest presenters on our episodes this summer, but are going to be able to answer questions you may have that match their own specialty areas. So we have Craig Scott, who you may be familiar with for his expertise in military records. Yeah. We also are going to be joined by David McCorkle. So David has bountiful knowledge on land records. Um, so we're delighted that he's going to be able to come be a part of the panel session. And I may have some, rec some questions directly for David myself, because mm -hmm. yeah, land records good. are always an area I know that I need additional mm -hmm. help on. And we're going to be joined by Connie Knox. And I think Connie is here in the, um, is watching the, the, the show today. But Connie, oh, I, didn't see her. I thought I saw her, but okay. Connie runs a fabulous YouTube channel called Genealogy TV and produces many different videos of educational videos around exploring genealogy and family history. So we're delighted yes, to have is. her join us too. So we are very excited about that and that um, will be the, the actual end of the summer series, but again, it will not be broadcast live. We want this to be a little bit more of an intimate experience for the participants as well as for the people on the panel. And a decision will be made later if it will be shared, um, but we want everybody to feel comfortable bringing their questions, bringing their brick walls. No question is, is too silly or too, you know, beginnerish to ask and 
hopefully with the panel that we have, there will also be um, expertise in the room for some of the researchers, more advanced researchers, or just an opportunity to kind of put our heads together because mm -hmm. we don't always have the answers. Nobody does, but sometimes when you can put your heads together with more advanced researchers to work through a problem, you'll get some new ideas. So that's what we're hoping for on the 29th. So with no further ado, it's time to, oh, well, I didn't change the thing. That's okay, because I was not planning to leave it up today anyway. So that's just yeah. a hint that I, that I shouldn't, because <laughs> I wanted to put our faces back up today. So Renata has failed on the last episode to prepare the slide correctly, <laughs> but we're going to talk about DNA. We're going to talk about our DNA stories and um, get back to our presenter, Shannon Christmas. Are you there, Shannon? Yes, I am here. Okay, so I have a, a I'm gonna, we're gonna try to present the questions in the order that we saw them. And I actually, the first thing I have is not really a question, but from our beloved friend, uh, Bernice Bennett, she just made a comment that I wanted to bring to your attention in case there's something you can say to advise her. But she said, I have several DNA matches on my X chromosome and some I know how they are related and others, well, I'm still researching the family connection. So do you have any like just specific guidance for her for researching those matches on the X? My first recommendation is to map out one's X chromosome ancestors. And there are charts available online where you can actually chart out each of the ancestors who could have possibly uh, passed down X DNA to you. Uh, my other recommendation is to find descendants of those known X DNA ancestors so that you can begin the process of mapping certain pieces of your X chromosome. In other words, yeah. if you have a third cousin that you know descends from a certain pair of two times great grandparents who could have passed down X DNA to you, uh, and you are matching that cousin, that third cousin on the X, then that is often a clear indication that those two times great grandparents that you share are the source of that X DNA. Mm -hmm. And anyone else who matches on that segment must have a connection to at least one of those two times great grandparents. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Great. I'm sure Bernice appreciates that. And then from um, the overambitious one who spends uh, her Saturdays every other Saturdays. And I keep <laughs> calling that person a her. I really don't know <laughs> what the, what, who the person is. So please forgive me. But um, the overambitious one says, what strategy would someone implement when testing for paternal validity of a deceased father using autosomal DNA? And then secondarily, is a Y DNA sample necessary? And Shannon, if you need me to repeat anything, just say so. Well, thank you ever so much for that question. I truly appreciate it. So if I am understanding correctly, uh, the person wants to find or rather confirm that their father is their father and that someone's father is. Okay. Father, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So in that case, I would start looking for both paternal relatives of that individual and maternal relatives, because that will allow you to identify which matches are maternal and which matches are paternal. And I know that sounds crazy, <laughs> but to put it this way, you want to be able to separate, to segregate the paternal matches from the maternal matches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in a case where you think you already know, then you want to start with what you think you already know. 
And you can validate or invalidate that very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then from that point, once you have figured out that all of these matches come from an unknown father, then you need to apply some of the strategies that were already discussed in the presentation, namely genetic networking and clustering, starting with the closest matches. Because that will tell you what family that biological father came from. And you can then build out a tree for that family and pinpoint which of the men in that family is most likely to have been the unknown biological father. It, it's just that, that easy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. for me, I do it every day. <laughs> right, <laughs> of course. Shannon, I want to take a quick break from the questions because um, I, I didn't see all the wonderful accolades um, that were given you in the chat. And so I really just want to kind of read down and I, I really hope I don't miss anybody, but um, you, uh, I'm trying to start in the right place. Um, so Bernice says, uh, thank you ever so much, Shannon Christmas. Um, Dear Myrtle says, wow. Sherry Hudson Passy says, that was fabulous. Thank you. Michelle Mailer says, or Mahler says, great information, Shannon. Thank you. Mavis says, thank you, Shannon. Lisa Margulis, Margulis says, thank you. Deborah Robinson says, Shannon, this presentation was excellent in all caps with a bunch of exclamation marks. I learned a great deal. Um, let's see, where am I, uh, Tania? Yolanda I love Bernice's Sanders. comment says, can you imagine spending three days with Shannon at Maggie? At Maggie, <laughs> like, yeah. like three days? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Yolanda <laughs> Sanders, uh, just several people saying, thank you, great presentation from Shelly Murphy. Uh, the overambitious one stating that their Maggie professor is on point with the DNA. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, Dale Calston, always phenomenal. Thank you, Shannon. I mean, I could just go on. Yes. Obviously, I didn't know it was going to be quite this long. Margo, thank you, Shannon. Eureka, uh, oh, she's saying absolutely. Um, <laughs> Marie Smith, great talk. I know what I'll be doing next now. Uh, Emerson is here. I kind of texted him and told him he needed to get in here. So thanks for coming, Emerson. You can replay from the beginning. Uh, Tania, you want to pick up a few of those last ones from Marsha Bembry? Oh, yeah, I, I scrolled down a little bit. So Marsha says, outstanding presentation, lots to think about. Um, Bernice is also reiterating how great the episode is. Shirley Brockenborough, mm -hmm. awesome presentation. So it yes. just goes on and on, Shannon. <laughs> so we all love you. We all thank you. And I just want to, maybe we'll grab a few more at the end. Um, the next well, question. You. Now, Shannon, the other part of the overambitious one's uh, question was, is a Y-DNA sample necessary? I would not say that it is necessarily necessary. Okay. Uh, if you want to try it, then you can certainly try it. I would say that you would probably get more out of autosomal DNA though, because many more people are testing mm -hmm. their autosomal DNA. Not as many are doing the Y DNA test uh, that might be helpful for this sort of case. Also, while you can attach uh, Y chromosome DNA to a specific surname because men tend to keep the same surname generation after generation just as they keep uh, the same Y chromosome going generation after generation. Uh, there have been, how do I put this, some modifications in certain family trees <laughs> and that, uh, well, the person who carried the name was not necessarily fathered by someone who also carried the name. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, as I always say, people make babies, names don't. So just something to keep in mind. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I, I immediately start to think of uh, 
Nathaniel Macon Hawkins and all of his descendants who carry the surname Green instead of Hawkins. <laughs> yes, those are my, that's my family that Shannon is talking about that he and I share uh, a common ancestor who was my third great grandfather. I think, was he your fourth or your, he was your fourth, right, Shannon? Oh, Philemon Hawkins would be my five times great grandfather. Oh, fifth, okay, yeah, he's my third. All right, so um, the last one I'm gonna read right now is from Eureka Floyd, another one of our faithful viewers. And she says, is there a resource that offers a workshop or tutorial for beginners to learn how to upload and then read their DNA matches? So for just uploading, I would go to your DNA guide dot com and they provide instructions on how to transfer data uh, it is rather simple uh, there are also guides there for how to do the basics of using uh, each of the given websites and i may be doing a suite of webinars hmm. on how to use each site uh, as a beginner okay great yeah. And I also offer tutoring one-on-one -on -one with various individuals who want to get one-on-one -on -one tutoring on how to use each one of the sites on an hourly basis via Zoom. Right, right. That's wonderful. Okay. Tania, you have a couple more? And I yes, have one more do. right now. Okay. So the MFP DNA Project is inquiring about the interpretation service from YFOL. Um, it was suggested to them to use it for a Y-DNA participant. Do you have any experience or comments about YFOL, Shannon? So YFOL is an extremely advanced Y-chromosome DNA test. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not as relevant for genealogy. It is more relevant for advancing the science of genetics. It is more relevant for filling out what we call the phylogenetic trees and understanding uh, the migrations of humankind. Uh, so if you want to do Y full, understanding that, then feel free. Uh, I generally tell people that it is important to realize what you are doing when you mm -hmm. test your DNA mm -hmm. so that you do not find yourself disappointed or full of information that you cannot use the way that you want to use. Yes. Make sure that the tool uh, fits the goal. Right, right, okay. excellent. Uh, Carrie Bright is wondering, what recommendations do you have for a budget-friendly way to test at every company? <laughs> So the budget friendly way is the way that I described in the presentation to test directly with Ancestry and 23andMe mm -hmm. because you cannot transfer into those databases. Mm -hmm. You have to test directly with Ancestry and 23andMe. And then you want to transfer your raw DNA data to those other sites that do allow transfers. All of those transfers are free. But if you want access to advanced tools, to more information at those sites, then you do have to pay a small fee. Yeah. Or in the case of my heritage, you have to have a subscription, which is no small fee. Mm -hmm. Right, that's mm -hmm. true. On the uh, other hand, I will say that there is some benefit to testing directly with each company. Uh, yeah. There, is a bit of an issue with version control right now in genetic genealogy, where uh, you test at one place and then transfer your data everywhere, but some places are struggling to match you to everyone the way that you should be because you test it with a certain version mm -hmm. of a test as opposed to testing with them directly. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Our good friend Ron Hayslip Hansberry, uh, I think his question has somewhat already yes. been answered. He was just another that asked, are there any recommended DNA courses? He says, with a laugh, this is obviously more than you can learn in just one episode. And I just want to use that as an opportunity to remind everyone that you can replay this and you can start it and stop it along the way as you need to. That's what I'm going to be doing. Um, but yes, we've also already shared several uh, web resources. Uh, just Google. I mean, you can find, yeah. like Shannon said, Google is your friend. So, well, I think he said Google Photos or whatever is your friend, but I just think Google is Google your Chrome, friend. Google Chrome, yes. Yeah, all of them are our friends. And then I have, um, if my phone would cooperate with me, um, Julian, Peggy Julian, says, I have a match, a probable unknown half sibling. She has no tree and not on ancestry for over one year. I searched the internet and messaged her in ancestry DNA, but no response. Is there any way I can find her? And I know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon. Yes, I am sure that you can find a way uh, if this person exists uh, to connect and figure out where they fit in your family tree. Uh, the first step is stalking them I on the it. internet. <laughs> I knew it. I already typed it in the mm -hmm. chat. <laughs> you have to find out where they live, where they used to live, where they went to school. That sort of information is the beginning to unlocking who their parents are, and then finding out who their grandparents are and going further and further back. And this is especially true for those matches that have roots in North Carolina, because there are so many records that have been digitized, both on subscription sites such as Ancestry, and then mm -hmm. on websites that make these types of records freely available such as family search. So Thank you can you. build out a family tree very easily for these types of matches. Uh, so you. I would start there. And again, uh, you want to continue to look in some non-traditional places to fetch information that might be hidden. It is not impossible. <laughs> nothing is impossible nope. and nope. i wrote down uh one of one of shannon's wonderful quotes where he said unlock the stories hiding in your dna and that's you know i was talking about being a detective and that's exactly what you'll be doing if you follow the advice that shannon is giving us you will be unlocking the stories that are literally hiding in your dna um, there's a question from Sharon Bruno, and she's asking, what is Shannon's, what are Shannon's thoughts about the changes to GEDmatch, and are you finding that people are moving away from the service? So I am aware of the changes at GEDmatch, and many of them I applaud. I applaud that uh, GEDmatch was able to create a system where everyone is opted out of law enforcement matching unless they specifically decide they want to participate in law enforcement matching. I think that is truly quite excellent. I am aware of the sale of Jed Match to a new company called Verogen. And I see that that was a necessary step for the owners of JetMatch, the creators, uh, and that as of right now, the company that is now in charge of JetMatch is keeping true to their word and allowing us to be genetic genealogists without necessarily having to be investigative genetic genealogists or genetic informants if we don't wish to be. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't sense that most people are moving away from the service. I am aware that because of the sale, 
uh, there are things that had to be done that require certain matches to be hidden until they make a conscious decision to continue participating in jet match. Okay. So that is my take on things. I still see mm -hmm. it as a wonderful resource where I've learned uh, more than I ever thought possible and broken through brick, brick walls that have been standing for hundreds of years. Yeah. All right. Well, we are right at the two o'clock hour mm -hmm. now. Um, so I think we have to begin to wrap up, but I, uh, I can't think of a better way to end the live no. season. Um, I do want to ask that those of you who have been enjoying the series and, and thank you for the wonderful comments that you've left not only today, but on every episode, as well as on our Facebook page that we've gotten lots of emails and messages, people just saying how much they've enjoyed the series. And Tania and I could not have done it without the wonderful, fabulous presenters exactly. that we've had who I want to make sure you all know we don't have any money. So <laughs> <laughs> all of these, we're bringing you nationally recognized presenters and they, just like we are, are giving our time yes. for free because it's all in the interest of trying to educate and bring, uh, bring us together as a group of people who research North Carolina ancestry. And I've heard from a lot of people who don't have North Carolina ancestry who've also learned a lot from mm -hmm. the show. So um, we're not quite sure what the future holds, but what I'd really like to ask everyone to do is please follow the page on Facebook and please subscribe here to the U YouTube channel and ring the little bell, even though I don't think it always does what it's supposed to do, but ring it anyway so that you'll get alerts as to when we're having a show, because I think there are some pop-up shows in the future. Um, yeah. So that's just a little hint right there. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned last time that Tania and I really had planned to present ourselves and that hasn't happened yet. So something is coming, but I just can't tell you when it will be. Um, but just thank you so much to everyone for all the support and please tell your friends and go back and watch the um, previous episodes yes. um, to get that past learning that was shared by all of our wonderful, fabulous presenters. Um, just another plug for our Q&A. Uh, we just wanted to be relaxed like a get together and it's your opportunity to talk one on one or have your question read one on one with an expert or a set of experts that are going to put our heads together right then and there to try to give you mm -hmm. the best answers to your questions or to suggest how you can move on. So we do hope that you will join us. Please um, go to the registration link, register to be with us. Uh, we're only going to do it for one hour on the 29th. We don't plan to go over. So um, please be there or be square. <laughs> so, <laughs> did I leave anything out, Tania? No, I think you've covered it. So this, I want to just reiterate how great this journey has been for us this summer in connecting with you all, connecting with our guests, um, and just learning more about North Carolina genealogy. And if I can just kind of close with a personal thank you to Tania, I think I have already kind of mentioned a couple of times how this came about. Um, this was something I wanted to do for quite a while and I just didn't have the confidence to strike out on my own. And when it hit me one day to ask Tania, and I think I texted you and said, you can, did. You take, can you take a phone call or yep. something like that? And I you know, gave her, told her what I wanted to do. I and mean, she didn't even hesitate. She did not even hesitate. And just having her to partner with me to make this happen has been everything for me. And so I don't know what's going to happen moving forward, but I just want to thank you so much, Tania, for oh. <laughs> um, giving me the boost that it took to, um, to make this happen. And Very kind of you to say that, Renata. And I've, yeah. and I've told Renata before, I thank her because I've been wanting to explore, you know, getting more present online. And this has been a learning opportunity for that. And also, I am very well aware of Renata's caliber of skill. So that's why there was no hesitation. So it, it's, I have to thank you too. 
<laughs> we go back a long way. I think I was pulling up emails from, I think it was 2009 or 2010 when I was yeah. talking to you about the WordPress thing. Yes. Um, you know, we both have been bloggers. So we've, we've been in, in this uh, interacting with each other for well over at least a decade. Gosh, yes. Um, but we just hadn't done anything. Right. Together. And this has been a so, great collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, so. So, okay. Well, I'm blabbing and it's 205. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Please share these videos. Um, and, and we look forward to seeing so many of you for the Q&A. And just thank you for your support. Shannon, again, I thank you so much for making this a marvelous, marvelous, yes. marvelous episode. And I just hope everybody will stay safe, stay well, wear your mask, wash your hands. <laughs> And please, please stay healthy. Yes. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.